In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. All things were made through him, without him was nothing. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness grasped it not. And the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. He came among his own, and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, he gave the power of becoming sons of God to those who believed in his name. No one has at any time seen God, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father. He has revealed him. These words of the prologue of St. John contain an embryo, the entire metaphysical depth and apocalyptic breadth of the visionary flesh story of the Christian drama of creation, fall, incarnation, redemption. The prologue, I would argue, is the analogotum princeps of any robust Christian metaphysics. These words of the beginning are reflective utterances, witnessing rays of the word, ever ringing forth as the future of Christian thinking within the apocalyptic drama of history, that imitative interplay of created and uncreated freedom and desire. For the God spoken of here is the same God before whom the four living creatures of the apocalypse cry out the triseon, the metaphys metaphysical liturgical spilling forth the praise before the God who was and who is and who is coming. This goes deeper than a mere metaphysics of Exodus, for the author of the prologue is one in spirit with the seer of Patmos. And I am proposing a metaphysics of Patmos, a yoking of creation and apocalypse, a metaphysical mindfulness which binds the prologue to the apocalyptic epilogue. Here to think the beginning is to think the end, to think the end is to think the beginning. Archaeology and eschatology exist within an analogy of discourses because they meet in the middle of the already and the not yet within a metaxology measured through the word made flesh. Christ is the concrete analogia entis, the center point and turning of history, the metaphysical meeting place or commercium between the created and the uncreated. The creative word is made flesh. He has entered into the umbrious world of the tangled tongues of humanity's perverse and violent desire. It is no accident that the hymn of the elders Worthy art thou, O Lord our God, to receive glory, honor, and power, for thou hast created all things, and because, they, because of thy will they existed and were created, precedes the opening of the scroll of destiny, wherein is seen the visionary reality of the fleshed horizon of desire amidst the earthly realities of war, famine, strife, pestilence, and martyrdom. My contention is that the future of Christian thinking lies in a metaphysics of Patmos, which is symbolic shorthand for a Christian philosophy of history, calibrated by the Analogia Entis, apocalyptically recast and unfolded in its incarnate and desirously mimetic dimensions. This is what will be programmatically and synoptically elaborated here. This style of metaphysics seeks to trace the imitative contours of an analogically Christocentric drama situated within the violent concrete annals of created histories, uh, excuse me, of created desires history of transvaluation. It concerns the drama of desire and the creaturely quest for deification in both the truth of its cruciformity and the lie of its inverted self-coronation. This metaphysics only exists as imitatio Christi. It moves from metaphysical vision to flesh and blood in an incarnated mimetic practice and performance of creaturely desire in response to triune love revealed upon the cross. 
Yes, today, Christian metaphysics must glow within an apocalyptic light and breathe forth the spirit of Patmos in imitative Christic desire. On task and metaphysical style, the overarching question of a metaphysics of Patmos is the following. How do we reactivate Christian metaphysical glory after its eclipse in modernity and its dispersion in postmodernity? How is Christian metaphysical glory to return on this far side of history within our vesperal diminishing, which is simultaneously a time of radical, radical intensification, Balthazar, and escalation, Girard? There are deep prophetic portents within the narratives, meta or otherwise, which herald apocalyptic ends. From the Hegelian end of history in the imminent beatific vision of absolute concept to Nietzsche's chilling cry of the madman and humanity's attempt to drink up the sea in the event of the death of God, to Heidegger's gathering of all of Occidental history in the metamyth of Bean's apocalyptic withdrawal, to the Krojev Bataille debate on the meaning of the end of history, to Levinas's prophetic, almost Old Testament assault on the violence of metaphysics, to Derrida's proclamation that philosophy has always already been living off its own death, to Deleuze's apocalyptic book written in this third time in this series of times, to name some of the most prominent motifs with which the apocalyptic tone of continent, which, excuse me, with which the apocalyptic tone of continental philosophy reverberates. Any Christian style of thought which ignores these apocalyptic events of thinking as hyperbolically rhetorical or poetically continental and thus incomprehensible fails to read the writing on the moving walls of history, the moving wall of history, and its diminishing intensification. Christian thinking must read the signs of the times and confront these events of closure. What I am not suggesting is that we read Christian thought as determined by these events, a la Marion, for example. I am suggesting that these events be mapped within a decidedly Christian philosophy of history, analogically calibrated, um, thereby reading these events from the priority of the victory of the slain lamb. To hold this decidedly Christian interpretation of history is to see with St. John, St. Irenaeus, the late Soloviev, Bulgolkov, Shivara, Peterson, Ulrich, Balthazar, Pieper, and Girard, that the ultimate meaning of history and our horizon of metaphysical interpretation lies within the victory of the Mysterium Iniquitatis against the Mysterium Iniquitatis. Did I say, Mysterium Crucis, did I say that? No. Mysterium, careful there, um, Mysterium Crucis against the Mysterium Niquitatis. If this is to be done, we must take serious Balthazar's claim that the time of the epic medieval summa has long passed, as has the lyric styles of spiritual treatises. A metaphysics of Patmos is a Christian style that seeks to non-identically repeat past figurations of Christian metaphysical glory. It resources the magisterial metaphysical Christian tradition in the spirit of the Alexandrians, vetus in novo patet, novum in vetere latet, in view of events of closure and their metaliptic rewriting of the Christian story. A rewriting on full display in the powerfully visionary triumvirate of the Hegelian, Nietzschean, and Heideggerian narratives. These narratives are what Lubach rightly calls forms of imminent mysticism, as they hold implicitly or explicitly matters little, the Comtean conviction that if Christianity is to be fully destroyed, then it must be positively replaced. The spoils of the Egyptians have been reversed and the coffers of Christian mystery plundered. Before such counterfeits, Christian discourse must marshal its pluromatic visionary truth and potential. Here syllogisms, logical proofs, and univocal games are but clanging symbols. From this vantage, 
A Metaphysics of Patmos shares the concern of Klaus Himmerle that we must seek a new thinking of being from a radically Christian perspective. In keeping with this concern, a Metaphysics of Patmos does not seek to be a translating or argumentative style, but a style of witnessing, a performance and practice of Christic desire. This approach is less Thomistic and more Bonaventurian, Augustinian, Pauline, but at its deepest, it is Johannine. This style further shares an elective affinity with pluramatic apocalyptic styles of theology and the reliance upon the apocalypses of Christian vision. I will return to this below. Further, this style resonates with the rhetorical and aesthetic return in Christian discourse as emphasis is placed on, um, excuse me, in Christian discourse as emphasis is placed on persuasive performance, not argumentation. But if the emphasis of more aesthetic styles is on beauty's power to persuade, a metaphysics of Patmos stresses the persuasive practice of imitation, which sees the future viability of Christian metaphysics consisting in being a new manner of seeing and participating in the world. Christian metaphysics is a spiritual practice existing within the passing temptations of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, within the violence of the flesh and blood horizon of concrete human relations. Here, Christian sanctity, conversion, and continual reconversion from violence is key. To cite Michel Siri, sanctity is a supernatural genealogy of truth that modernity never suspects. We speak the truth only in loving innocently. We discover we produce nothing except through becoming holy." End quote. A metaphysics of Patmos lives by this Christian truth. In the nebulous horizon of the future of Christian thinking, a metaphysics of Patmos is a style where imitative Christic desire alone is credible. Rules of Operation. A metaphysics of Patmos is a, re, is a radically de-absolute and non-foundational and in two intertwined senses. First, it is a creaturely metaphysics. Its existence is spoken forth ex nihilo from the words creative love, for without him nothing has been made. As creaturely, it is grounded in the non-ground of the analogia entis, understood as the metaphysical expression of the Christian dogma of creation. The Analogia Entis is shorthand for the metaphysical tradition of Christianity, which has baptized a metaphysics of participation in the Pentecostal fire of the ex nihilo. With the dogma of creation, the philosopher's understanding of being is transubstantiated from substance to analogical relationality. A radical analogization occurs that forever desubstantializes, decategorizes, deessentializes, and deabsolutizes being. This move assures the metaphysical distinctness and distance between God and world. Yet this difference is not a aloof indifference. Rather, this distance of creation is the condition of the exchange between God and creation. Here, God's presence shimmers in the between of creation as it's in and beyond. Creation is an iconic expression of God's creative loving glory, revealed especially in the creature's secondary causality. Here, our created being is understood as dynamic relation, response, and gift. This is the formal object of a creaturely analogical metaphysics in its non-foundation. But insofar as a metaphysics of Patmos is an analogical recasting of the Analogia Entis, it is always already an Analogia libertati, Libertatis. Its formal object is a concentrated reductio into the mysterium of the creature's free acceptance of being as gift. The first non-foundational sense of a metaphysics of Patmos is always dramatized because our created being only exists in the one concrete transnatural order of sin and grace. 
As Shivara says, the properly Christian perspective has the final word, for there is only one concrete order between God and creature in this concretely existing world, the order between original sin in Adam and redemption in Christ the crucified, end quote. Philosophy only exists within the converted rays of the Mysterium Crucis or within the tragic and continuous birthing of the Mysterium Iniquitatis. This is why John's prologue transitions so quickly from the word's creative utterance to the drama of humanity's darkness of refusal. A metaphysics of Patmos holds with Eric Peterson that Christ's revelation abolishes epistemological and metaphysical neutrality. It is a final, theologically inclined and informed style of metaphysics whose formal object of created being is always already recast apocalyptically from the dramatic final supernatural end of the creature. This is the twinned twofold sense of non-foundation. Within this apocalyptic recasting of the Analogia Entis, metaphysics post Christum Notum only is in response to the actuality of Christian revelation. The dramatized formal object of a metaphysics of Patmos can only be measured against the death of the fleshed creative word upon the cross. On a discursive level, a metaphysics of Patmos is a discourse of discourses in keeping with its non-foundational swerve. It exists in an analogy of discourses in a suspended middle with styles of pleuromatic apocalyptic theology. The formal object of these styles of apocalyptic theology is a self-uttering of the triune God's intention towards the world from the vantage point of the final victory of the Lamb slain. Within these styles of apocalyptic theology, the book of Revelation is privileged and interpreted as the analogatum princeps of Christian apocalyptic. In this approach, Christianity must not be seen as a religion of revelation. Rather, to foreground one's theological style as apocalyptic is to hold that the very essence of Christianity is apocalyptic. Christianity is the apocalypsis of triune love revealed through Christ, the only Son of the Father, through the Holy Spirit. This approach, like a metaphysics of Patmos, is thoroughly Johannine. A metaphysics of Patmos concerns the creaturely side of this drama, where history is the apocalyptic opening of created freedom towards the triune God of creation and redemption. While apocalyptic theology concerns the self-uttering of the trying intention towards the world as the backdrop of the whole of history, these two apocalyptic discourses exist in an analogy of discourses and are together expressive of the very drama of creation and redemptive recreation understood as the interaction of created and uncreated freedom. The Analogia Entis recast apocalyptically as the Analogia Libertatis. Nevertheless, metaphysics never ceases to be metaphysics because grace presupposes and perfects being. Or as Ulrich says, grace arrives along the path of being. But being's mystery is seen from the alpha point of its creation, viewed from its apocalyptic omega point. Here, metaphysics lives wholly within the double glory of creation and recreation, the prologue and the epilogue, centered on Christ, the concrete analogia entis. Metaphysics, as creaturely and analogical, finds itself in losing itself in relation to the crucified word. Here, its glory is conversion and its power is weakness. Metaphysics' only breath is found in inspiration as a spiration of imitative giving thanks. Metaphysics is doubly deabsolutized, relativized before the creative word's death upon the cross. Metaphysics, metaphysics functions in imitation of its creatureliness only in relation to the anterior call of the Christian God of the double glory of creation and 
recreation. For my Thomas friends out there, this approach does not deny the formal possibility of natural theology, but it suspends it as inconsequential to the dramatic formal object of the finality of the creature's response to being as gift measured against the cross. It accepts Shavara's gloss on Romans 1.21, they, knowing God, exchange the glory of the changeless God for an image made in the likeness of changeable man. Paul seems to imply that one can arrive at a formal concept of God as the ground of the creature in keeping with Vatican I. However, we must keep in mind Romans' distinction between knowledge and acknowledgement. This formal knowledge of God as the ground of the creature is drastically distinct from the living acknowledgement of the tri-personal God of Christian revelation. This formal knowledge of the divine does not prevent this knowledge from being idolatrous. The truth of the priority of actuality over potentiality is ever mixed with idolatrous falsity of human, all too human conceptions. Danilu makes a remarkably similar point in God and the ways of knowing. Thus, concretely, we have once again, as Shivara saw, only the choice between the tri personal God of Christian revelation and the pagan, a redeemed conception of the divine or an idolatrous, um, fallen idolatrous conception. All right, now I'm really going to start stirring the spot, so you have, to, you have to forgive me. I have a little bit of a mischievous nature, as my students know. Read from the perspective of a metaphysics of Patmos, as Balthazar said, quoting Ernst Bloch, God is dead and Jesus Christ killed him. Here the God of narrow-minded forms of scholasticism and transcendental theology is done away with, and so too is the generic homo religiosus of phenomenology of religion. Shaler is only haltingly correct when he says, man believes only in God or an idol. In truth, one can only believe in Christ or an idol. Nietzsche knew this in his heart of hearts. Therefore, after God's death, Christ alone remains. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, lost my place here for a second. Therefore, after um, God's death, Christ alone remains in an inversion of the only one of the Johannine Holderlin. Have I been understood? Dionysus versus the crucified, the conclusion of Ecce Homo. Alas, Nietzsche is more Christocentric than many a Christian thinker. Only Christ shows the way to the Father through the movement of the Spirit. Only Christ shows what and who God is in, God, in the depths of God's self, triune love. Philosophy's quest has always been for the absolute, but once the absolute utters itself to humanity and becomes incarnate, all conceptions of the divine become but empty, a hollow flautus vocis. Before a metaphysics of Patmos, Questions of natural theology or ontotheology ring hollow. Its ED fix concerns itself with the concrete flow and drama of history read in view of the creature's free response to being his gift measured against the mysterium crucis. He came among his own, and his own received him not, but to as many as received him, he gave the power of becoming sons of God. No one has at any time seen God the only begotten Son, he has revealed him. Only in this apocalyptic drama is the mystery of being fully unveiled. History, desire, and mimesis. A metaphysics of Patmos is foremost an analogically calibrated Christian philosophy of history that knows with Pieper that a philosophy of history that is severed from theology does not perceive its subject matter. Therefore, metaphysics is recast apocalyptically and functions in relation to the book of Revelation in conversation with styles of apocalyptic theology that prioritize the, tri um, the triune intention towards the world and the Johannine corpus. Up until now, the programmatic vision and metaphysical structure of a metaphysics of Patmos has been laid bare. Yet if this was everything, my approach would run the risk of being overly speculative. 
Vision must always be made flesh. This enfleshing occurs when desire and mimesis are seen as the catalyst for this analogically and apocalyptically calibrated philosophy of history. The drama portrayed in the prologue and the visionary vantage of the epilogue does not take us away from the concrete. Rather, this metaphysical and visionary approach propels us into the drama of our, the concrete of our concrete humanity in relation to the Christian God amidst the real flesh and blood horizon of human relations. Our metaphysical response to being as gift only occurs in the hink at nunc and in media res. Metaphysical mindfulness occurs in a metaxological chiaroscuro ever situated in the flesh and blood of human imitation and the underground of desire. Here, human history is the history of desired desires, to cite Kozhev. And this history is a history of violence. The metaphysical beginning of the prologue and the eschatological end of the book of Revelation does not imply a reading of history as completed after the owl of Minerva has taken flight. No, a truly Joannine approach understands the metaphysical and visionary depiction of Christianity as a depiction of concrete human relations still taking place. An apocalyptic metaphysics of desire eventuates in the flesh and blood horizon of human relations. He who says he loves God and hates his brother is a liar. There is no pure intellectual process that sees things from the point of view of the Hegelian sage and a post-teleological resolution of the master-slave dialectic. The concrete reality of warring brothers will take place until the eschaton, until the final discessio of the wheat and darnel. Any true and viable Christian philosophy of history thus must pass the test of warring brothers as Girard prophetically demanded. John's apocalyptic vision concerns a fleshed doing of the truth, a riding with one's life. Others, otherwise, it is but a speculative counterfeit mirroring. A metaphysics of Patmos, then, is a spiritual practice <clears throat> and straining after sanctity against the violence of our humanity. It is a metaphysics of the conversion of desire's violence to Christ's nonviolence, expressed, mediated, and tested in the love of neighbor. The origin and the violence of human history is not the Hegelian battle for prestigious recognition nor is it the founding murder of a Freudian or Girardian stripe. The things hidden since the foundation of the world go metaphysically deeper. It is the very rejection of our created being as gift, our refusal to humbly receive in grateful love that is the catalyst of human history. It is the lie of idolatry that we shall be and know like God, Genesis 3.5. However, this metaphysical drama of the rejection of being as gift is always already a matter of imitation, as Raymond Schwager has convincingly shown. Or to paraphrase Augustine in Book Two of the Confessions, all who wander far away and set themselves up against God are imitating God, but in a perverse way. The desire to be and know like God is a Luciferian, whispering insinuation of the desire for self-apotheosis which perverts the creature's true imitation of God into a parody, a false imitation. Desire is ever and always mediated, communal, social. The metaphysical origin of counterfeit deification burrs the violence of human history, the murdering, murdering of Abel, the warring of brothers, the violent annals of the atrocities of history as seen in mimetic rivalry, persecution, scapegoating. The formal object of a metaphysics of Patmos is thus further concentrated into the story of Christian transvaluation, that is, the story of the redemption of created desire from its deformity, the twisting of its desire for the supernatural by the lie that we are able to be and know like God, a lie which ever perpetuates and blinds the human heart through imitative pride, hatred, blame, rivalry, and resentment. This history is the history of the transvaluation of human desire, a history of the myriad and subterranean ways that desire suggests itself through idolatrous 
protein permutations. History is a story of the idolatrous trans-deification of human desire and its demonic underground potential to the point where the hidden envy and resentment towards God is unleashed in the violent crucifixion of the incarnate word. This is the moment of the redemptive turning point of the history of desire. He came among his own, and his own received him not, but to as many as received him, he gave the powers of becoming sons of God. Desire only exists in relation to this name. Hence Nietzsche's exasperated lament, almost 2,000 years and not a single new God. In this view of history, as Girard knew, in keeping with Chavar's concrete reading of philosophy, there can only be two ultimate mediators of desire, Christ or Antichrist. The history of desire post-Christum Notum treads on Christian knowledge given through the foolishness of the cross and, it's, and is a dramatic battle of imitation. Like von Balthasar shows in volumes four and five of Theodrama, this battle can only intensify because the satanic moves against the Christian victory already assured by the lamb slain. This victory polarizes and makes the battle all the fiercer. This reality is further attested to with Girard's understanding of history as an escalation to extremes and is intimated in the 12th provincial letter of Pascal. We are back to the inner law of history consisting in the victory of Christ over Antichrist in the concrete realm of desire's mimetic transvaluation. Read from the flesh scene of the metaphysics of Patmos, history is the apocalypse of imitative desire measured against crucified love. <clears throat> Conclusion, Christ, the concrete analogia entis. As Shavara and Ulrich intimated, and Balthazar brought into explicit expression, Christ is the concrete analogia intis. In the words of Rowan Williams, Christ is the heart of creation. Christ enacts the admirabili commercium, the bringing together of the uncreated and the created, freedom and desire in an analogical exchange without confusion and separation. The word enters his creation. This is made possible by the analogical distance between God and creation, allowing for an analogical unity and difference of the divine and human natures in one person. Yet, as the prologue intimates, the human world that the word enters is ruled by humanity's false search for apotheosis. This world is the world of incomprehension and blindness, and from and and a world from which the creative word is exiled by false desire. As the great Anglican William Temple says, it is part of the deadly quality of sin that it hinders us from seeking a cure. The word thus must pro-offer a non-violent counter-desire that confronts and unmasks the violent nomos of history, inaugurated through our free rejection of being as gift and its consequence, blind mimetic perpetuation. To do this, one must once again learn what it means to receive the poverty of our flesh creatureliness. The creator must show the creature how to receive creatureliness by receiving it himself. Christ's kenosis is the truth of creaturely being and desire exceed it into its Trinitarian depths. The word's humble reception of humanity is the witnessing performance and practice of the acceptance of being as gift in, true, in the truth of humble thankfulness to the fatherly origin of this gift. But Christ models and mediates far more than the truth of our creatureliness. He shows its rootedness in Trinitarian mimesis. For the Word is the one who receives all that he is from the Father in his eternal sonship of being as begotten. The Word's eternal desire is a mimetic response. He comes not of his own will or desire, but in the name and agapeic desire of the Father. The Word is an imitative witness 
that sees, hears, and performs what he sees his father doing. He is, his being is one of imitative, joyful reception, Eucharistic begottenness. The word made flesh takes up and receives created humanity in imitation of his sonship as being as begotten, understood as a non-identical imitation of the father. To fully know how to imitatively receive our creaturely being is to imitate and participate in the mimetic processional truth of eternal sonship. Christ shows that our created humanity, that the created humanity he has taken up is an imitative imaging of his triune being of sonship. Thus, the more we enter the mystery of the receptive truth of our created being, the more we become truly human and fleshed, the more we become participatory imitators of the dynamic mimesis of Trinitarian life without erasing the analogical law of dissimilarity and our created participation in the unio caritatis. A metaphysics of Patmos is a metaphysics of Trinitarian response rooted in the twofold created and uncreated mimetic performance of Christ the concrete analogia intis. Christ is the only mediating witness of the truth of the Trinitarian origin and meaning of creaturely being, freedom, and desire. Here, metaphysics becomes an ecclesial practice and performance of imitatio Christi, a metaphysics of the saints understood as the culmination of analogical creaturely metaphysics. Yet this mimetic Trinitarian participation is ever tested in the concrete violence of desire. Here, imitatio is configured in the words of Augustine to the disfigured deformity of Christ by which alone we are formed, end quote. If Christ shows that, that the truth of desire is kenotic deformity, the truth of servitude and the nonviolent laying down of one's life for the other, then it follows that our love and imitation of Christ is always mediated socially and is in the test of warring brothers. Christian love must be practiced, tested, proved in the ceaseless conversion and reconversion of desire from violence. Christian metaphysics must show forth an imitative new path of seeing and participating in the world. Only then will we find that path to discovery and production that Siri spoke, or that genius of sanctity that Simone Weil passionately, passionately called for. And so a metaphysics of Patmos returns to the four living creatures crying out the Triseon before the God who was and who is and who is coming. The mysterious truth of the book of Revelation is condensed to the drama of the acceptance or rejection of the creaturely, metaphysical, liturgical spilling forth of praise before the triune God at whose center is a lamb slain. Within this world, praise is enacted through desire's transvaluation into servanthood, understood as the kenotic, Christic truth of desire. Yet this desire of praise must be proved daily and into the future in the concrete flesh love of neighbor, in imitation of the Christus deformis, ever amidst the world's violent quest for the suggested princely lie of desire's self-deification. Thank you very much.